Well, good morning, Kensington family. It's great to see you all. Would you guys go ahead and stand? Let's worship the King this morning. The one who has amazing resurrection power, transforming power. Come on, let's praise him together.
Awesome, awesome, awesome. Man, welcome. Welcome. You guys can't even see. Joyce, hang on just a second. I don't know if you guys know this. Joyce is incredible, and she comes, and she works so hard. I remember when you first started here, you didn't know how to play guitar at all. And now you're up here in front of everybody playing guitar, singing, doing the whole thing, taking us to the throne room and all that, right? Excellent. Can we get up for Joyce and the team? It's so awesome, man. We are so privileged to have such an awesome group of people and musicians to lead us in worship. My name's Sam. I'm one of the people around here at Kensington. So glad that you guys are with us. And I do want you to know, I do want to recognize that y'all are the real ones, okay? You're the real ones. It's 4th of July weekend, and you're in church. Jesus sees that, okay? That, let me confirm, that's a little gold star on your chart in heaven, okay? Well done. Okay, we get it. You're super saved, cool, whatever. But we're glad that you are here today. Now, we are starting a brand new series that's about 10 weeks long. You're like, Sam, 10 weeks? Well, yeah, it's gonna take us through the duration of the summer that we're calling Lessons from the Lake. And essentially, we're spending the summertime going through stories from the book of Matthew that Jesus taught like around the lake. A lot of his ministry was done around the Sea of Galilee. And so we're kind of taking that theme and running with it. And so there's a video we're going to trek through with this guy named Tyler on some adventures this summer to sort of set up our announcements and our greeting every week. And so this week is our first video. So if you want to check this out and uh, see if it makes sense to you. All right, dude, we're rolling. You ready? Hey, Kensington, it's Tyler here with Lessons from the Lake. I'm super pumped to be with you guys. I'm what you call an extreme influencer. They brought me in because this summer is a big deal at Kensington. We got a lot of information for you guys, and they told me they need you to get the info. They need you to lock it in, keep it in the vault this summer. So what I want to do for you guys, to let the team know we got everyone here right now hidden behind this camera, they didn't believe that I was going to get the point across. They didn't believe that I could make this summer great for you guys. I went all in. I went all in with lessons up from the lake. Uh, dude. What? I, I don't think that says lessons from the lake. Yeah, it does. No. I, I told the guy. No, I, <laughs> dude. Dude, that says, I think that says lesions from the lake. All right. I mean, I'm sure it's fine, right? No, are you sh Yeah. What? Yeah, that's, that's missing an S. My wife is going to kill me. <laughs> Dude, it'll be fine. It, I mean, you can barely tell. No. No, it's not good. <laughs> so we're going to journey with Tyler this summer, and uh, the videos will come to make sense as they come along. You guys are like, what did I just watch? What was that? It's just a little tidbit to say, hey, it's okay to laugh in church. It's okay to have fun in church, right? Speaking of having fun in church, this Wednesday night, we are hosting our mid-eats here at Orion. How many of you guys eat food? Oh, let me, hold on. Some of you, okay. How many of you guys eat food? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Perfect. Then this event is for you. On Wednesday night, this Wednesday night, we're doing it the second Wednesday of each month. We're going to have an old school potluck, think like old school church picnic vibes out here in the green space. And so if you want to come and hang out, it's a great opportunity for your kids to meet other kids, for you to meet other people, for you to feel more connected as the community and the family of the Orient campus. We would love for you guys to be here. Obviously, if your last name is A to M, bring a side dish. Uh, if your last name is N to Z, bring a dessert. If you have cats, please don't bring anything. Um, we just don't want to pull cat hair out of our chocolate chip cookies. That's all. I mean, no judgment. It's just reality. So that's happening this Wednesday night. Make sure you guys mark your calendars. Come hang out. It's going to be a great time. And then here's the deal. It's not even one of those like bait and switches where it's like, come to this party. And then we're like, cram Jesus down their throat. No, it's literally we're hanging out. And we're hanging out with each other. And we're building community with each other. And we're going to eat food. Because everybody eats, right? Remember, we all raised our hand. Everybody eats. So come hang out. This Wednesday night, we're doing another one in August. So mark your calendars for that. Now, today is a cool day. 
We are streaming in from our Troy campus where our senior pastor, Brian Mowry, is speaking to all the campuses simulcast simultaneously. And it's launching our new series, like I said, that we're calling Lessons from the Lake. So in a few minutes, the team's going to put the feed in. We're going to jump into the Troy campus and hear what Brian has to say. But before we do that, I want you to stand up. I want you to crisscross the room. I want you to shake somebody's hand, meet somebody new, tell them maybe the grossest thing you've ever had at a potluck. And we'll be back in just a minute with the stream. Good morning, everybody. All right. Well, my name is Brian, and it is just a privilege to be able to share a message with you today. And uh, this message, as we've been doing uh, periodically, is going to every one of our campuses today. So it's being live streamed into all six of our campuses and for whoever's online as well. So just wanted to say hello to those of you who are watching in Traverse City. Uh, Beck and I are going to be in Traverse City next weekend. We're so excited to be with you. Uh, to those of you in Clarkston, in Orion, in Birmingham, in Clinton Township, and also here in Troy and our Brazilian campus, good morning to all of you. I think I got them all. I'm always so nervous that I'm going to miss, miss one, but uh, I'm so thankful to be here to be able to share the Lord's word with you. And uh, if you're here for the first time, real special welcome to you. Uh, we believe the Lord's led you here, and this is, this is a place for you to belong. And uh, we're, just, we're just so glad uh, that you're with us today. You know, tomorrow, not tomorrow, next week will mark one year since my family moved here. I can't believe that, but one year. We've been here one year in Michigan, and uh, we've learned so many different things and just wanted to say thank you to the whole church. Thank you so much for just your, your love for us, um, for receiving us so well. I'm just assuming if you didn't like us, you've left by now. So, uh, <laughs> But everybody's been just so generous and so loving, and we're just really grateful. Uh, it's been amazing to look back and see that we've been here one year. And we've learned so many different things about you. We love being a part of the Kensington family, and there are just so many great things about this family. You know, as I reflect back on it, one of the things I love most about this family is that we love Jesus. I love that. I actually love about Kensington that, you know what, we, we come from all different backgrounds. We have different opinions on things. But you know what, we keep Jesus at the center. And that's the most important. And if you're here for the first time, just know that about us is that we really are looking to follow Jesus. That's, that's our main goal is we want to learn and discover more about who Jesus is and grow in our walk with him. I love that about Kensington. Another thing I love about Kensington is this, is that we're not perfect people and we know it. I love that. I love that. Is that we don't pretend to be perfect people. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't perfect. Yeah. Look at yourself. You probably need to look at yourself. You ain't perfect. You're not perfect. And we know it. And we're okay with that. This is the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he invites all of us to come and be a part of his church, no matter who we are, no matter our faults. And he's doing a work within us. And I love that we are a church that just embraces that. We're not perfect. Uh, we know it. Uh, we're just trying to grow in our relationship with Jesus. And, and really... There's a lot to say about this Kensington family, but one of the things that I think is the most dear, the most, the thing that I love the most is that we are about the one. We, we, we are for the one. We're for the person who doesn't yet know Jesus because we have experienced the grace and mercy and forgiveness and the love and the power and the presence of Jesus. We want that for all people. And so we exist, our Sunday mornings really exist for people 
who don't yet know Jesus. Come, bring your friends so they can hear about who this Jesus is. Our events, our, our move out teams, really they're for people who don't yet know Jesus. And we wanna reach as many people as possible for Jesus Christ because we believe in him and we believe in his love and his power and his mercy in people's lives. And I love that this church, maybe more than any church in America, has committed themselves to reaching people who are far from God. I love that because I was far from God. You were far from God. And I love that heartbeat. Let's keep going after that. Let's keep going after that. It is Michigan and it is the summer in Michigan. And I've heard you need to embrace that because it could be winter in Michigan very soon. Very soon. We're not quite sure. Oh, my bad. I'll stop talking about it. But it is summer and there are so many great things to love about summer in Michigan. And one of them is the lake culture. I love the lake culture. I lived in Minnesota for a while. They claim 10,000 lakes. I don't know how many you claim, but in Minnesota, they claim even like, even if there's like a puddle, like that's a lake just because they want the most lakes of all the states, right? But I love this, this lake culture. If you were ever to come to my house, you'd learn that I also love those wood signs that have phrases on them. Like I hang them up all over the place. Becca is pretty annoyed at me because she just wants a picture on our wall that's a picture of something. I have like, there's slogans everywhere. And so if I owned a lake house, which I don't, but I'd be, re I'd welcome receiving the gift of a lake house, but I don't, I don't have one right now. But if I were, I would take it. But if I don't, if I had one, I'd hang up those like wood signs everywhere with little slogans on it. And, and, and you know the lake slogans, maybe you've seen these in other people's lake houses, or maybe right now you're at your lake house and you have these, but let me just show a few of them. I'd hang this one up. The greatest memories are made at the lake. Isn't that true? It's just like somehow memories at the lake are fonder. Or how about this one? Relax, you're at the lake. Yeah, I love that one, because it doesn't work in other settings, right? Like if I were to hang that in my office, like relax, you're in my office. Like that's not gonna work, right? Or relax, you're at the dentist. Doesn't work, right? But you put lake on that thing, boom, that sign is selling. I love this one, life is better at the lake. Does anybody agree with that? Yeah, some of us right now in the room are kind of going, I wish I stayed at the lake. <laughs> as opposed to coming back and listening to this guy, right? Or how about this one? Heaven is a little closer in a home by the lake. That's a good one. It's true. And that's why I think we all need a lake home to be a little bit closer to heaven, right? That's why we need it, a little closer. How about this one? You're not, if you're not barefoot, you're overdressed. That's a good one. Or may, my favorite is this, you never know how many friends you have until you have a lake house. I like that one. Although I, I would rewrite that and I would say, you never know how many actual friends you have until you sell your lake house. <laughs> then you really find out who your friends are or if they were just in love with your lake house. Jesus spent a lot of his ministry around the lake. I don't know if he had these signs hanging up in his cabode or not, but he spent a lot of time around the lake. When you read the gospels, when he's around the Sea of Galilee, this is his ministry. And most of his ministry happened around the lake, next to the lake, even on the lake. And there's so many lessons that we can learn from Jesus around the lake. The lake that we're talking about when it comes to Jesus is the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is a fairly large lake or a sea. In fact, it's about 13 miles from the south to the north, and it's seven miles wide from the east to the west. A big, a big lake that, that Jesus ministered around and on. At the deepest point, it's about 157 feet deep. Uh, the weather in Israel around the Sea of Galilee is in the wintertime, 57 degrees on average. Sounds pretty good, right? Minnesota, uh, Michigan sounds pretty good, 57 degrees average. In the summertime, 88 degrees average. Pretty nice temperate weather around the lake. However, around the Sea of Galilee, it's also known that large gusts of wind and rain can come at any point. Maybe this is why there was a storm on the lake that Jesus had to calm. This is the lake, the Sea of Galilee, that Jesus ministered around, spent a lot of his time around discipling people, teaching people. It was around this lake where he called many of his disciples for the very first time. Many of them were fishermen. 
It's around this lake where Jesus delivered a demon-possessed man. It's around this lake where Jesus performed the miraculous catch of fish. It was on this lake that Jesus calmed the storm. It was on this lake that Jesus walked on water. It was next to this lake where Jesus, after he died and rose from the dead, he visited Peter as Peter jumped into the water, into the lake, swam to shore, and Jesus reinstated him as a disciple. So many things happened around the lake. And so for these 10 weeks in this sermon series called Lessons from the Lake, we want to look at what did Jesus teach his disciples? What is he teaching us around the lake? And so what I want to do is I want to officially welcome you to the lake. Welcome to the lake. Whether you're at your cabin or at a campus, welcome to the lake. And here's what I want to challenge you to. I know it's summer, but here's what I want to challenge you to. Is I want to challenge you to attend every single week. I might say, well, I can't. I'm going on vacation. That's fine. We have this amazing thing called online. And if you don't know what that is, just find anybody under the age of three, and they'll teach you how to use it, okay? They'll teach you what to do. But here's the thing is we're going to be progressively learning these lessons from Jesus around the lake, and we don't want you to miss out. And so if you're at the lake with your family, that's a great place to have church, a great place. If you're on the dock, that's a great place to have church. In any of our campuses, that's a great place to have church. Stay connected as we go through this series. I want to challenge you to stay at the lake over these next 10 weeks. I'm going to pause here, and in just a moment, our uh, ushers are going to come in all of our campuses and receive this morning's offering. Before they do that, I just want to say thank you uh, for your generosity to the church. Um, this is our opportunity to give to what the Lord is doing through our family here called Kensington. And uh, this offering goes to help the ministry here, uh, both locally and globally. And it's also, more than that, just an opportunity for us to worship the Lord by saying, Lord, we, we give you everything. That includes our finances, our time, uh, our lives. And so it's an act of worship. So let me pray, and then we'll jump into the message. Lord, we, uh, we thank you so much for this opportunity to give back to you. Um, you've been so generous to us in so many ways, and this is just really an easy way in one sense for us to say, Lord, we, we give you our whole lives. And Lord, we pray that you would take this offering and, and use it to bless your kingdom, uh, do things um, way beyond what we could imagine or think. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As the ushers are receiving this morning's offering, let me jump into the message for today. And I'm calling this sermon a question, and that question is this. Did you get my message? Did you get my message? Why don't you look to your neighbor and say, did you get my message? Did you get my message? Have you ever heard somebody ask you that? Hey, did you get my message? And maybe it got lost in junk mail Maybe your kid deleted it on text. I don't know what happens. But that question's asked. Did you get my message? And that's the question I want to ask each and every one of us today. Did you get my message? Not my message, but did you get the message of Jesus? He has a message for us. Did you get my message or has my message been missed? I remember several years ago when I was in my early 30s, I was taking a trip, and I was driven by my friend to LaGuardia Airport. That's in New York City. And I lived in Connecticut at the time. This was probably about an hour, hour and 15-minute drive or a four-hour drive, depending on traffic. Kind of like Detroit a little bit, right? And so we, we took off. We went there to LaGuardia Airport. Now, at this time in my life, I was young. I didn't really check my itinerary very often. I just knew when I was flying, and I was excited to go on this trip got my buddy to bring me to LaGuardia. We get to LaGuardia, right when we arrive there, I get a text message from the airport saying that my flight had been delayed. Bummer, right? But the bigger bummer was this, is that as I looked at it, it said, your flight from Kennedy Airport has been delayed. Oh. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with New York City, but they're both airports in New York City, but they are far away, and it is a pain to drive between them, a real pain. And so what happened was I missed the message. I missed my flight, and I think I lost a friend. <laughs> 
Did you get my message? I missed the message. Did you get the message? Have you heard the message of Jesus? Did you miss it? Have you heard it? Did you get my message? You know, sometimes we don't get a message because the person giving it is unclear. Have you ever had that happen? Did you get my message? Well, I I heard you speaking, but I couldn't make sense of the words you were putting together. It made no sense. Other times, a person can be very clear. Just recently, I was at one of the malls here in Michigan, and I was, I was in a, a store looking for new sneakers, because I just don't have enough sneakers, I'm not sure. And so I'm looking for sneakers, and there's this three-year-old, beautiful child there, pulling down all the shoe boxes. And I kind of look around, and I'm thinking to myself, what's happening here? The parents might, must not be around, throwing shoe boxes now. And I look, and no, the parents are right there, right there, observing this, pulling shoe boxes down pulling all the the, the shoes out and shaking them out, yelling and screaming. And then finally, finally, the parents are gonna address this. I'm like, oh, praise God. Parenting is still happening in our country. This is wonderful. And they kind of come down and they said, hey, buddy, maybe you don't wanna do that. If I'm a three-year-old boy and I hear my parents say, maybe, I'm thinking, do it some more. Right? So now this kid is climbing on the shelves, throwing, it was like a rain shower of Nike sneakers. Men, women, young and old are getting hit by all these shoes. Now listen, the message from the parent was unclear. Maybe you want, I want to take you back 30, no, 40, (laughs) how old am I? 42 years ago when I'm three years old. And let's pretend I'm in that shoe store and my dad's with me. And I begin to take some shoes off the shelf and throw them. One, that shoe would have never left my hand (laughs) because the message would have been very clear. If you throw that shoe, Brian, there's gonna be some problems. Clear message. You know, sometimes I think we think the message of Jesus is, is not very clear, but actually Jesus speaks a very clear message. The question is, Have we received the message? And maybe the question is this, is what is the message of Jesus? And that's what I want to answer for us today. And I want to make it as simple as possible because his message is so clear. And I want to share just two components of the message of Jesus. This is what the message of Jesus is. And we we find them in Matthew's gospel, chapter four. This is where Jesus is in a lake town called Capernaum. And in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, and then also 17 to 20, this is what the passage says. I'm going to read it for you. It says, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth, then left there and moved to Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulun and Nephtali. From then on, Jesus began to preach. Here's what Jesus said. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew. They were throwing their nets into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. I wanna share the two components that we learned here from Jesus right around the lake about his message. This is the message of Jesus in two parts, two words, here they are, turn and follow. Let me unpack each of those. Jesus calls us to turn and to follow. First, he calls us to turn. He says this, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near The first part of Jesus' clear message is for us to turn. And there's two aspects of this. We turn from and we turn to. First, we turn from. This word repent, maybe even hearing that, you're kind of like, ugh, I don't know if I want to, let's not talk about repent or repentance. It, It doesn't seem like a comfortable word. It's maybe a very churchy word. What's this What's this mean? And so let me share a little bit about what repent means because this is what Jesus is calling us to is to repent. So we should know what it means. And actually this word was a very familiar word to the people. They would have understood this word and not only familiar but often used word. 
Like, we don't go around talking about repent. Ah, oh, I repented today. You know, you, don't, you don't tell your buddy, you know, while you're playing golf, hey, how's, how's repenting going? Right? It's not a regular part of our vocabulary. But actually, the original word was. People use this word quite frequently. It's this word metanao. And what it means is to, to change a person's mind, to change your mind, to change the way that you're thinking about something. And therefore, to repent means to change your mind on something. You know, when I first moved to Michigan, when I'd get in the car, I would use my GPS everywhere I went, absolutely everywhere I went, because I didn't know how to get to the mailbox, barely. I didn't know anything. And so I'd enter it into GPS, and then I would I'd make my way there. I didn't know how to get to work <laughs> the first day. I had to put it into GPS in order to get there. Several months after living here, I said, okay, I'm going to stop using GPS. Now I know some things, and I'm going to try to apply it and get to the places I need to get to. And there are many times where I was driving without my GPS, just trying to learn where I was driving, and then I noticed, I'm going the wrong way. And in that moment, I could have said, you know what? I'm going to keep going this way because I don't want to have to admit that I'm going the wrong way. And so I'm just going to keep on driving until I get somewhere that looks appealing to me. Then I'll stop and pretend that's where I should be. Or what I could do is go, oh, you know what? I'm going the wrong way right now. I'm going to get off the next exit and turn around and go in the right direction. I'm going to change my mind about the direction I'm going in. I thought I was going in the right direction, but I discovered that I'm not. And therefore, I'm going to change my mind, which will change the direction of my life. This is what repentance is. That's all it is. It's a changing of mind. Wow, I'm, I'm going the wrong way. I'm not going to keep, I'm not going to dig my heels in and pretend it's the right way. No, it's the wrong way. So I'm going to get off the exit, the nearest exit, and I'm going to turn around and go in the right direction. This is what it means to repent. It means to go, oh my goodness, this, this, this way that I'm going down, this, this, this bitterness that I've got myself stuck in, it's not the right way. I need to get off the nearest exit and turn around and go in the other direction. This gossip that I've landed myself in, sometimes it feels good, but it's not the right way. I need to get off the exit and go in the other direction and start encouraging people. This lack of forgiveness for other people, it's the wrong direction. I got to get off the next exit and learn how to forgive. This pursuit of myself and my desires and my goals and my dreams and my way, it's the wrong direction. I got to get off the next exit and go into the will of what God has for my life. That's all repentance is. It's a changing of the mind. I'm going the wrong way and I'm not going to pretend it's the right way anymore. And so this can happen in a few different ways is that we need to turn from, we need to change our mind on the sin that's in our life. A sin's another big kind of churchy word, right? But all that means is anything that separates us from the Lord. Wow, there's some things in my life right now that just are keeping me from knowing the Lord. I need to kick this addiction. These things that I'm looking at on my computer screen, I need, I need to get out of that so that I can get closer to Jesus. These things, this anger that's in my heart, I, I need to root that out so that I can follow Jesus. I need to change my mind on it and go in a different direction. And for some of us, we, we might need to do that right now. Lord, I, I need to turn to you and I need to turn from, turn from this sin that's in my life. But another thing we can turn from and we can repent of, we can change our mind on are the lies that enter our lives. A lot of times people don't talk about this in terms of repentance, but I believe it's a big part of our lives is that we all adopt these lies about ourselves that aren't true, lies that, that don't match up with how God thinks about us and views us. And so you might be carrying a lie around right now that, man, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not loved by God. I'm unlovable. I'm broken. I'm, I'm, I'm not useful. I don't have a purpose on this planet. And all those are lies. No, you've been created by God in his image. You've been given a great purpose, a great mission on this planet. You are dearly loved, so much so that he went to the cross for you. That's the truth. And so you need to repent of those lies. 
and say, I'm gonna change my mind on these lies that have been sown into my life and I'm gonna go in a different direction. And Lord, I'm gonna believe that, yeah, you love me so much that you died for me. I'm gonna believe that you have a great purpose and plan for my life. I'm gonna believe that you're gonna provide for me. I'm gonna believe. I'm gonna believe these things, Lord. And this is what it means to repent, to turn, to change. But not only is repentance turning from something, probably more importantly, it's what we turn to. And this is the message of Jesus. He says, repent from your sins and turn to God. We turn to God. We turn to a personal relationship with him. And and I think probably the greatest story in scripture that reveals who our heavenly father is comes in Luke's gospel chapter 15. It's of the prodigal son. You might know the story. This is where the son decides to leave the father, take his inheritance early, disowns his father, abandons his father, turns his back on his father, and then he discovers that he's in a bad spot, and so he wants to come back home to the father, the one he disowned, and he begins to prepare this speech that he's gonna give, hoping to get back into the home. And as he gets to the end of the the home driveway, the father sees the son, He doesn't even get the chance to use his speech because the father, he he sees the son. He has compassion on the son. He runs to the son. I love that. This is the heart of the father, that when you turn to God, he doesn't just kind of sit there and wait for you to get to him. He runs to you wherever you are in the coordinates that he finds you. He might find you in your addiction. He might find you in your hurt. He'll find you in your brokenness. And he runs to you. And then I love this, how the father embraces the son. He he doesn't kind of of come up and slap the son and say, what were you thinking? How dare you? Take your inheritance and run from me. No, he runs and he embraces the son. And, And so you don't have to have any shame or guilt coming back to your heavenly father. He embraces. And then, and then the father walks with his son back home. I love that. Imagine that walk with the father. So proud. My son has returned. And then what does he do? He throws him a celebration. My father, my son, my son has returned. And and this is what you can expect when you turn to the Lord. Not condemnation, but love and mercy and grace and forgiveness and a welcome back into the family. This is who our God is. And I gotta tell you, if we rethink repentance, I actually think repentance can be one of the most favorable things that you can do for yourself. One of the most favorable things you can do for yourself. Maybe right now you find yourself stuck in things that you know are wrong. I wanna encourage you to turn to God. Experience his grace in your life. That's what you're gonna experience. Are you hurt? I wanna encourage you to turn to God. Experience his love, experience his healing. Are you held captive by a lie? I wanna encourage you to to turn to the Lord, experience his truth in your life about who you are and who he is. Are you broken? Are you tired? Are you afraid? I wanna encourage you to turn to the Lord and experience freedom that comes in him. Turn to the Lord, turn to the Lord. This is the first part of the clear message of Jesus. Turn, turn to God. Turn to the Lord. And then the second part of Jesus' message is this, is turn, but then follow. And this is what it says in the passage. It says, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Let's break that down. This is the second part of Jesus' call in our lives. Turn, but then to follow. And he says, follow me. As I was thinking about this, I was looking at this. Wow, follow me. Follow, follow me. And I gotta tell you, I think we've nailed this one. Like, I think we're hitting a home run in this. Let's just, let's just point at me. I, I, think I'm, I think I'm batting a thousand here with follow me. I mean, I think I'm doing as good of a job as anybody can do. Follow me, follow me. I don't think, I, 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 think, I'm, I think I'm nailing this, follow me. Because, you know, I, I'm really good at following my dreams. I'm really good at following my agenda. Like, I'm killing it there. I'm really, really good at following my, my opinions because they're right. I'm excellent at following my convictions 
and following my ways. I mean, nobody on the planet is better at following me than me. I'm really good at it. Now, here's the problem with that. That's not the call in our lives. The call is to follow him, to follow Jesus. And, and this is where the tension comes because in our humanness, we're pretty selfish people. And we get really good at following me instead of following him. But his call, and, and if you really wanna experience freedom in, in life, and if you really wanna experience th- the Lord in your life, you need to learn how to follow him, follow his lead, follow his teaching, follow his ways. And, and when the disciples hear this message from Jesus, follow, follow me, and, and I will show you how to fish for people, this is what it says next. And there are two lessons we can learn from the disciples in how they follow. But this is what it says. It says, and they, and they left their nets at once and followed him. There are two things that we can learn from this, right from the disciples and their action. Right, follow me, and this is what they do. They left their nets at once, and they followed him. And the first thing we can learn about following from them is this, is that to follow Jesus, you often have to leave things behind. They left their nets, and they followed him. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to leave some things behind, you can't just say, okay, Jesus, we'll be right there and, and grab, grab their nets, grab everything, grab our pride, grab our agendas, grab our blueprints. Okay, Jesus, yep, we're coming. Just make sure we get all of our stuff, all of our things. And no, no, sometimes you need to leave things behind in order to follow Jesus. We've got to say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to leave my way behind and I'm going to adopt his way. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop bitterness because I know that's not the way of the kingdom. I'm going to drop that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adopt a hopeful attitude and joy in my life. I'm, I'm going to drop gossip. I'm going to drop anger. I'm going to drop all these things that I know are bad. I'm, gonna, I'm just going gonna, gonna to drop them. I'm going to leave them behind, and I'm going to follow Jesus. But notice here what the disciples dropped. They dropped their nets. And sometimes... We need to be willing to drop good things in order to follow Jesus. These nets were good things. These nets were their livelihood. It was how they fished. It was their way of life. It was their income. It was their food source. Yet when Jesus called them to to come and follow him, they they even dropped a good thing in order to follow him. And, And this is the level of commitment that Jesus is asking of us that we'd even be willing to drop the good things and follow him, follow him. The second thing we learned from the disciples on this is it says that they left their nets, and did you catch it? It said, at once, and they followed him. You see, when it comes to following the Lord, I think we need to be better at doing it at once. I I think we're pretty good at delaying, pausing, and waiting. Where these disciples, they left their nets at once and they followed. My kids make fun of me because it takes me a really long time to get into the pool, um, particularly Lake Michigan, because I don't know if you know this, but these lakes, even in August, are really cold. I don't know if you knew that or not, right? I don't know if you, maybe you're just used to it. I'm not. And so what I do is I kind of like tip my, dip my toe and I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. But my kids, they just kind of run and dive in. They don't even check it out, right? It's like four hours later. I'm like, eh, it's warming up. Maybe I'll get in there. And I think that's what we do in our faith way too often. Is the Lord, we we know the Lord is calling us to something. And we're kind of like, let me, uh, let me see. Is it going to make me popular? I don't know if it's going to make me popular. Is it going to cost me something? I don't know about that. What's going to happen here? Is it going to make me look foolish? Uh, I don't know. At once, when the Lord called, they went. And if you read on in the Gospels, it led to some pretty exciting adventures, some amazing things. There's this hymn called, Come Ye Sinners. And uh, one of the verses says this, Come ye weary and heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. And if you tarry until you're better, and that word tarry just means if you pause, if you wait until you're better, 
you will never come at all. And I think sometimes we tarry in our faith. We, we wait, we hesitate. Maybe we think, oh, once I get everything better, then I'll come to the Lord. Once I get everything sorted, then I'll make the move, I'll step out in faith. And the Lord's like, you know, I'm not interested in you being perfect. I'm just not interested in that. I'm interested in whether you'll obey. I just wanna know, will you take a step of faith? Will you follow, even if it makes you look foolish? And then there's this great promise to this follow. He says, follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. See, friends, part of the clear message of Jesus is this, is that I, I want you to turn to me, I want you to follow me, and as you follow me, I'm gonna show you some things. I'm gonna teach you some things. And the thing that Jesus really wants to teach us is how to, how to reflect his glory and his mercy and his grace and his love to a world that desperately needs it. Just like a, a person who fishes attracts fish to them. What he wants us to do is to go out and attract people to Jesus, that others would see of his goodness and his grace and his mercy and his love. And as I was looking at these two things, turn and follow, th this clear message from Jesus to us, turn and follow, I, I was just thinking about them, and, and as I looked at them, I, I thought, wow, you know what, we need both, but sometimes we don't operate in both. And so, if I turn, but I don't follow, I'm being disobedient. If I just say, oh Lord, yes, 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 I believe in you, Yes, you're my creator, you're God, yes, yes, yes. But then I don't follow any of his teaching, then I'm being disobedient. Or let's say I learn how to follow. And I just kind of, I know all the things, I go to church, I do this, I'm even in a Bible study, all this kind of stuff, I'm following, I'm following. But I never actually turn to him daily, then I'm disconnected. We need both. We need to turn to him, be connected with him on a daily basis ready to follow him. And so in closing, I, I wanna ask you in all of our campuses today, if you were to imagine Jesus standing in front of you and you're just looking face to face, what, what would you say to him today? When it comes to following and, and turning, what, what would you say to him? Maybe for some of you, you'd say, you know what, Jesus, for the first time, I wanna turn my life to you. I've never done it before, but, but I wanna experience your love. I, I wanna walk with you. I wanna give my life to you. Maybe for you, that's what you need to do. For others of you, maybe you say, you know what, I've, I've turned to you. I believe in you, God, but man, I've, I haven't been following you. I know you're calling me to some things and I've just, I just haven't been listening. I've been tuning you out. And maybe now is the time for you to say, you know what, I, I, I wanna... I wanna to listen to you, Jesus. I wanna follow you with all my heart. Or, or maybe you're sitting here today or at your cabin, wherever it might be, and you're like, you know what? I'm following. Like, I, I know the things to do. Like, if anybody looked at my life, they'd say, wow, that is an amazing Christian person. But actually, I don't ever find myself turning to Jesus. I feel really disconnected from him. And maybe this is a moment where you need to say, you know what, Jesus, I, First and foremost, I need to turn back to you. I need to have that one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with you. And so in just a moment, I'm gonna hand it back to all the campuses. Uh, I'm gonna pray and then, and then the campuses can take it over. But, but I wanna pray for those things specifically. And maybe you fit into one of those places. And I wanna pray for you in that. So would you bow your heads with me as, as we pray together? Lord, I, I thank you so much that you are here with us now. Thank you for all the lessons that we get to learn and those lessons that you've taught us around the lake. I thank you for your clear message to turn and to follow. And Lord, right now, if there's any person listening to this who've, who's never turned their life to you, Jesus, I pray like the disciples that, that at once they followed. I pray that that at once would be right now that there might be some here who would just turn to you and say, Jesus, I wanna give you my life. I wanna spend the rest of my life following you. And I believe if, if you've kind of prayed that prayer, said that to the Lord right now, that 
man, it is a, a day of salvation for you. It's a, a day where the angels rejoice. It's the start of a beautiful relationship that you're gonna have with Jesus. Maybe for others of you, you've turned, but to be honest, you're, you're not following. You, you believe, I believe, but I'm just not following. And maybe there's specific areas even in your life where you just, you've kind of, you, you know you're not following the Lord in. Lord, I pray for, for this group of people, probably is all of us in one sense. And I pray, Lord, that, that we would follow you in everything that you call us to. Or maybe you're, you're here and you're listening to this and, and you're following, you know the things to do. If you've got the sequences down, you've, you've got the formula, but when you really reflect on your personal relationship with Jesus, there's a disconnection. And Lord, I pray for this group of people that we might rediscover our personal relationship with you, Jesus. Meet us as we meet you. Draw near to us as we draw near to you. And so as I hand it back to the campuses now, we pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we continue to worship this morning, I want to invite you guys to stand. And whether it's day one of your journey with Jesus or 30 years into this. Let's make this our prayer this morning that we would become more like the person of Jesus. More righteous, more holy.
And so that's the challenge, right? To turn and to follow. And so if you would like prayer this morning, we're gonna have our prayer team available up here in the front. And if you're new around here and you'd like to get connected to Kensington, we have a thing in the lobby called The Hub. And it's a group of people that are wearing bright orange shirts and they would love to get you connected to answer any questions that you have. Make sure you're plugged in. And this is a personal invitation to join us on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, we're going to have a big potluck, big picnic out out in the yard out there, and it's going to be a great time. So otherwise, we thank you guys so much for being here. Love you guys, and we'll see you next week.